We have new developments in the Microsoft exec murder case going on in Florida. Attorneys for defendant Mario Saldana want the state's attorneys to be disqualified from prosecuting the case. Now, in court documents filed this week, attorneys claim the state plans to use texts, emails, and voicemails between their client and his wife, Shanna Gardner, in its case. Well, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office obtained Saldana's cell phone and other electronic devices through a search warrant. Saldana's attorneys say communications between Saldana and Gardner are privileged and that the state should refrain from reviewing the seized devices. Actually, it's communications between Saldana and his attorney. Saldana and Gardner are charged with first-degree murder in the death of her ex-husband, Jared Breidigan. The state has said it plans to seek the death penalty in the case. Court TV crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson has a look back at the case. Jared Bright again appeared to have it all. A new job as a Microsoft executive, living in sunny Florida with his wife Kirsten and four children. We had just had London, she was six months old, so things were good. Kirsten had two children with Jared, London and Bexley. They also shared custody of his nine-year-old twins from a previous marriage. On the week that we did not have the oldest two kids at our home, Jared would take them out to dinner. It was referred to as date night in this agreement. The agreement kept Jared and Kirsten in Florida. Bride again and his ex-wife, Shanna Gardner Fernandez, were in a bitter custody battle. What was that relationship like, he and his ex-wife? The relationship between us and his ex-wife um, was not cordial. Our communications were always in writing because there was not mutual trust between the two households. On February 16th, 2022, Jared had one of his scheduled daddy date nights. After dinner, he dropped off his twin daughter and son at his ex-wife's home in Jacksonville Beach, Florida, and headed home to St. Augustine. On the way, he stopped to get his two and a half year old daughter, Bexley, ice cream. She was in the back seat of his SUV. He then called Kirsten, telling her he loved her and would be home soon. How did you learn something was wrong? As time started ticking by and the time that they're usually home passed, I, I can't even describe it, but like, I just knew something's not right. Her fears became reality after an officer answered Jared's cell phone, telling her Bexley was unharmed, but they needed her to come by the police station to hear about her husband. They later on that night told me that he had been shot. Where did this happen? Because he usually gets in the car and just drives home. I had talked to him. Jared was not a victim of any robbery gone wrong or carjacking. Police say he was the victim of a targeted attack on a one-way road he traveled often. Jared came across a tire police say was intentionally placed right here in the middle of the road in the sanctuary neighborhood of Jacksonville Beach, Florida. That's when someone came out of these woods and ambushed the father of four, killing him on the spot. For almost a year, no answers. Then in January 2023, a break in the case. Henry Tennant was arrested for the following crimes. Conspiracy to commit murder, second degree murder with a weapon, accessory after the fact, to a capital felony and child abuse. Now investigators say that Tenen has pleaded guilty in the case and admitted to shooting Brightigan. Henry Tenen pled guilty to murdering Jared Brightigan. Henry Tenen has admitted that he in fact was the shooter. According to court records, Tenen once lived in this house that was once owned by Brightigan's ex-wife's current husband. And now investigators have charged both the ex-wife, Shanna Gardner, and her husband, Mario Fernandez Saldana, with first-degree murder. We will be filing a notice of our intent to seek the death penalty. Prosecutors call Gardner the mastermind behind the murder. Both Shanna and Mario have denied any involvement. Meanwhile, Jared's widow says that she suspected them from the beginning. Had you suspected that Mario was also involved in all of this? From very, very early on, um, I felt, like obviously I didn't have any evidence, but I felt that Mario Fernandez and Shannon Gardner would be involved somehow. 
Borgart. All right, still with us, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Franz Borgart, and former NYPD deputy inspector Corey Pegues. And Franz, I'll start with you. Now, we got a, a couple of things that in play here. There were communications, of course, between um, spouses, and there's communications between a lawyer and his client. Both are privileged communication. What this um, defense attorney is saying is that they sent this information over to them for discovery. Now, the prosecutors put a team together that was supposed to redact anything that was considered confidential. It didn't quite turn out that way. Now the defense wants them removed from the case because this information has been widely shared around the office and they can't fairly try this case. Your thoughts? So normally the privilege, the attorney-client privilege or the spousal privilege, Michael, deals with the admissibility of testimony or, or evidence by one privileged party against another. You can't compel a spouse to testify against another spouse. You can't uh, compel an attorney to testify against his or her client. It doesn't necessarily have to do with obtainability in the investigative process. So I don't know if it's a valid uh, basis for recusal. It certainly puts it certainly puts the defense on a decisively disadvantageous uh, platform or footing against them. Um, you know, but I, I just don't know that that's going to be sufficient grounds to get that, that entity off the case. Certainly, it should not come in at trial against the defendant. Uh, certainly, that should remain privileged. Yeah, I agree with that. And Corey Pegues, I got to say, you're a former police officer. Police are involved in this. It's the same arm. Prosecutors as well. They have got to, for, for public confidence, take these types of responsibilities very seriously. When they're given discovery, given information, all this electronic information, they have to abide by the rules. Otherwise, we lose all confidence in what they're doing. Oh, absolutely. They have to be transparent. You have to have transparency through the case of uh, me not being a lawyer. Franz broke it down very, uh, very clear. And like he said, I don't think that it would be admissible in the trial. And sometimes mistakes happen. So we'll see if if the mistake was so big that um, they're going to get kicked off the case. Yeah, and that's what I don't think they did it with malicious intent. I, I, but they put, like Mike, you said they put the team together. <laughs> they put a team to look at this. I don't know how they missed that. Yeah, exactly. What kind of team? <laughs> well, I'll tell you how they missed it. Um, what they're saying, Corey, is that essentially there were, so there was emails, and the attorney said that he told Saldana to put confidential on any emails that were going directly to his lawyer, and there were attachments to those emails. According to the prosecutors, and Franz, I'll throw this question at you, what they're saying is that there were these documents that I guess at one point were attached, but at this point weren't attached and did not have confidential on them. So where do you come down on that? Because I certainly understand how that could happen. You get a piece of paper, uh, it's attached to an email, marked confidential, you download it, but now it's no longer attached to an email that says confidential. So I think that that's a problematic argument because if I know who Mario's attorney is and I know what the email address is, I'm not looking for confidential. I'm looking for the, the, the sender, right? I'm looking for the communicator. I'm not, I don't care that there's confidential or not confidential. Now I will tell you from practical experience, what I would do when I was a prosecutor in the instances I would have such communications is if I knew it was a communication that was from an attorney, I would halt. I would stop, I would, I would put the materials down, I would inform the attorney, hey, look, this was in there. I just want, from a professional and ethical standpoint, I didn't look at it, but I'm letting you know so that if you need to do something about it, you can. Uh, but generally speaking, I would, I, would, I would be looking for the identification of who is the sender or the communicator and not the word confidential. The confidential word isn't what makes it privileged. Yeah, I would agree 100%, but they say some of this communication is very incriminating, so the defense is not going to go away, I promise.